you're on live sir okay Now it is over to Natras, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Bapra, sir. A very good morning to all. On behalf of Sri Vishnu College of Pharmacy, I, Dr. K.S. Natras, today's program coordinator of this session, and Dr. A. Srinivas Rahul, organizing secretary of this online international FDP, SDP4, Equity Pharmaceutical Analysis and Coordinator Mr. Kranti. For this webinar, would like to welcome our guest speaker for today's section, Dr. Mallikarjan Narayanam, Analytical Technology Leader, Almac United Kingdom, and Dr. K. Prasad, Principal, and Dr. Kumar V.S. Nemani, 
director Trivishnu College of Pharmacy, Jaimwaram, to the day five of one week online international webinar on innovations in natural product driven drug discovery and analytical chemistry, organized by the Department of Pharmacognosy and Department of Pharmaceutical Analysis in association with Association of Pharmaceutical Teachers of India, APTI, Association of Pharmacy Professionals, APP, Society of Pharmacognosy, and MIBO Group. Firstly, I would like to introduce our principal and director to the participants. Our principal, Dr. K. Prasad, completed his BPharm, MPharm, and PhD in Andhra University, Vishakapatnam. He worked in various teaching designations, professor in HKE College of Pharmacy, Gulbarga, and he is serving as a principal of our college since 2011. Dr. K. Prasad published about 26 papers in reputed national and international journals. He has guided two PhDs and guiding three PhDs and several PG students. He is specialized in the research areas like drug interaction and neurological diseases. He has a wide research experience and several DST and AICTE research grants to his credit. Dr. Kumar V. S. Namani, Director of the Vishnu College of Pharmacy since 2018, holds BPharm and MPharm degree from Andhra University, Vishakapatnam. He holds PhD degree from Naipur, Mohari, and postdoctoral fellowship from McGill University, Montreal, Canada. Dr. Kumar was specialized in the research areas like oncology, autoimmune disorders, respiratory disorders, and pain. He has published and presented more than 70 papers in reputed Indian and international journals and conferences. Dr. Kumar V. S. Namani has a, over 14 years of industry research expertise on drug discovery and development and managerial experience. Now, I request Dr. Kumar V. S. Namani, Director, Vishnu College of Pharmacy, to give welcome note. Over to Kumar, sir. Thank you, Dr. Natras. Uh, greetings to everyone, and welcome to day five of uh, international webinar on innovations in uh, natural drug driven drug discovery and uh, analytical chemistry. Uh, I am pleased with the responses uh, of the past five days uh, for this webinar series. Uh, I see a very good interaction from the Zoom participants uh, as well as the, the YouTube uh, participants. Uh, I, on behalf of the Sri Vishnu Education Society Management, uh, that is uh, Chairman Sri K. V. Vishnu Rajagaru, Vice Chairman Sri Ravichinam Rajagopal, and our Principal uh, Dr. K. Prasad, and uh, the senior staff and staff of uh, this college. I, on behalf of all of the management uh, uh, and the staff, I welcome uh, each one of you to this uh, webinar series. Uh, yesterday, you all seen uh, an, a, a stalwart, a guru, and Dr. Sarnish Singh, uh, who has enlightened us with various technologies. And today is one Sisha of Dr. Sarnish Singh is uh, going to enlighten us. I'm pleased and uh, happy to see that uh, Dr. Malikarjan is uh, also an alumni of NIPER. Uh, I'm sure uh, his uh, uh, research experience at NIPER and uh, his experience in industry, uh, especially in BBRC, that is a uh, the BMS uh, Biocon Research Center in uh, Bangalore. Uh, it's one of the leading research collaboration uh, Indian uh, Institute with uh, an American company, an uh, American based company, uh, doing a great work. Uh, and uh, his experience will definitely uh, enlighten us. And presently, he's working in UK. It makes him uh, a distinguished speaker today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Malkarjan, for uh, accepting our request and welcome you for uh, this webinar series. Uh, 
uh, it's, it's, it's really a pleasure for us uh, to have you. And I'd like to thank at this uh, note uh, all the principals and the faculty of other colleagues who are continuously supporting this event. And I'm looking forward for a good interaction uh, as happening in the past. Uh, I wish uh, all of you a, a good day. Yeah, thank you. Go to Dr. Nathras. Thank you, sir, for your uh, welcome note. And uh, it's my immense pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Malikarjan Narayanam, to all the uh, online audience. Dr. Malikarjan Narayanam obtained his PhD in pharmaceutical analysis from Naipur, Mohali. He is currently working as a technical leader in Almac United Kingdom. Previously, he worked as a team leader in Biocon Bristol Mayor Speed Research Center, Bangalore. His expertise includes method development, validation, characterization of impurities by LCMS, NMR, and implementation of process analytical technology. And he is having hands-on experience of various hyphenated analytical instruments like LCMS, LCNMR, GCMS. He has published more than 12 research articles in various international journals like Journal of Separation Science, Journal of Pharmaceutical and Biomedical Analysis, Magnetic Resonance in Chemistry, Journal of Chromatography A, Chromatographia having a good impact factor, not less than three. And he won Best Poster Presentation Award at the 63rd Indian Pharmaceutical Congress in December 2011. Based on his publication, he expertised on forced degradation studies, hydrophilic interaction chromatography, characterization of impurities and degradation products. And he gave many presentations and uh, in conferences. He was recipient of Gold Medalist Award in Naipur MS Pharmacy. Received a very prestigious award, Inspire, Innovation in Science in Pursuit of Research and Excellence, Fellowship from the DST, and various industrial awards in his career. With this introduction, I request Dr. Mallikarjan Narayanam to begin his talk. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nataraj, uh, Srinivas, and uh, Kumar for such a nice introduction. So I hope my voice is audible to you, uh, Nataraj. Audible, sir. Yes, sir. Audible. Okay. Thank you. So uh, thank you all uh, for joining this uh, session. So today my talk is based on applications of LCMS in pharmaceutical industry. So we'll look at some case studies and recent advances. So in this session, I'll take you through basic introduction to LCMS. We'll understand what is LCMS, what type of ionization detect, detectors, as well as different experiments we do in LCMS. Then slowly we will go through some of the case studies, including identification of impurities in the pharmaceutical industry, metabolites, quantification techniques, and slowly into the much more complicated biologics and then in pathophysiology of diseases. Now, let me start with introduction to LCMS. As you know, the term LC, indicates liquid chromatography and MS indicates mass spectrometry. So LC-MS is an hyphenated analytical tool where LC is coupled with the mass spectrometry. So as you see in this slide, any sample, either it could be a tablet, a biological sample, a liquid, is prepared in the form of a solution and then it is injected through an HPLC which goes through column and through a UV detector then into a mass spectrometry. In the mass spectrometry, the compound is then ionized at the ionization source. Then it goes to detector 
and to get a spectrum. So the key point here is mass spectrometry deals with the generation of gas phase ions. So whatever the spectra you see are gas phase ions. So whatever the spectrum you see is dependent on mass to charge ratio. So it is always called as M by Z. So now we'll see some of the ionization sources used in LCMS. Now, if you see, there's an interface between the LC and MS. So this interface is nothing but the ionization source because in HPLC, we have the solvent eluting from which is a liquid phase and whereas in MS, it's a gaseous phase. So you have to convert the liquid into a gas phase so this ionization or the ionization interferes for us achieves this thing. So in this case, HPLC, we have to always use an aqueous organic based solvents with volatile buffers because you have to convert it into a gas phase. So we should always use an organic volatile buffers. If you use any non-volatile buffers, uh, sorry. Presentation, you can share your presentation, sir. Oh, it's not sharing my presentation. I'm sorry. So, Nataraj, are, uh, are you able to see the presentation? Sir. <laughs> okay, so sorry guys for this. So let me start again, uh, sort of at least with the introduction, just to show you the picture because I think most of you haven't seen this. So, so start, in, start from beginning sentence. Okay. Okay, so you can see my slides, right, Dr. Natraj? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so as I have told, uh, probably I have to restart again, only a couple of slides. So my talk is based on application of LCMS in pharmaceutical industries. So in this, in this talk, I'll take you through what is LCMS, then some of the applications in pharmaceutical industries, starting with identification of impurities, metabolite ID, quantification of genotoxic impurities, then into a complex uh, biologics and role of M LCMS in understanding the disease pathophysiology. So let me start with introduction. So in the LCMS, uh, you analyze the liquid phase sample through the chromatography, LC chromatography, then followed by into a mass spectrometry. So in this case, mass spectrometry deals with generation, separation and characterization of gas phase ions according to their mass to charge ratio. So there are two key points here. One of them is getting into a gas phase ions because mass spectrometry is a gas phase technique. And the other is generating the ion as per their mass to charge ratio. So in the next slide, we'll look about the interface of LCMS. In the LCMS, we always have to use volatile buffers because they have to evaporate in the gas phase. So this interface acts as a key tool where the liquid is converted into a gas phase and then analyzed through the MS in high vacuum. So to convert the liquid into MS, we used various ionization like electrospray ionization and atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. To convert into gas phase, we have to always remember that using a volatile buffer makes it easier. If you use a non-volatile buffer, it always clogs the interface. So remembering that using volatile buffers in LCMS is an, a key important point. So the research on this coupling, that is the liquid phase to gas phase began in 1970s with the advent of two techniques, that is electrospray ionization, and the other is atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. Now we'll quickly take you through the basic principles of this ionization. 
In electrospray ionization, which is especially used for the polar analytes, having any amino heteroatom, which can easily take a proton or give away a proton. So in this case, the LC enters into the, the sample solution into this, where a nebulizer gas is sprayed with generally a nitrogen, and it passes through a potential voltage difference of three to five kilovolts. So when this passes through this voltage difference, the liquid is sprayed into fine droplets containing the charges. When the charges, when the opposing forces between these charges exceed the surface tension of the particle, it then tends to generate the smaller uh, particles by coulombic fission and then generating these charged particles. So if you want to use a positive mode, you can apply a positive potential. And if you want to use a negative mode, negative potential, which generates the molecular ion. So in mass spectrometry, the word molecular ion means M plus H plus or M minus H minus. So remember, it's always mass to charge ratio and ESI and APCA are called as soft ionization techniques because they generate molecular ion. So for suppose if your compound has a mass of 200, you get a mass spectra of M plus H which will be 201. So you see a line at 201. Now this is the principle of ESI. Now in APCI, which is mostly used for the nonpolar analytes. So uh, it is extremely important when we do analysis to choose a appropriate ionization source. For nonpolar analytes, we use APCI because here the solvent molecule transfers the charge. So let me let us show you the principle wherein the sample solution is again transferred into this needle along with the nebulizer gases. Here we apply a corona discharge needle. So he, there will be a needle which is called as a corona needle. Uh, don't confuse this with the coronavirus we see nowadays, but this is uh, a terminology used in mass spectrometry where you apply a corona needle to ionize the solvent molecules. So in this case, the solvent like methanol, acetonitrile used as an organic phase are initially charged. These charges are then transferred to analytes. So as a result, this can analyze even nonpolar analytes. So there are two key differences here. The, in the gaseous phase, it is in the ionization occurs in the gaseous phase, whereas here the solvent transfers the molecular ion or proton or withdraws the proton. However, the end result in both the cases is the same generation of molecular ion, which is M plus H plus. So these two are most commonly used ionization techniques. There's a third one, which is called as MALDI, but it is not used in, in coupled with LC generally, but however, recently it is also being used. So in those cases, you have a matrix and a laser uh, where the laser ionizes the matrix and then matrix transfers the proton to analyte that is mostly used for the proteins. However, in recent years, electrospray ionization has been the choice of ionization technique for almost all the applications. Now we have seen the ionization tools for the interface between MS. Now let us go through some of the mass analyzers. So now we, we done the separation initially we have done the separation through chromatography. Now we ionize the analytes into gaseous phase through electrospray or APCI. Now this gaseous phase is then analyzed through various mass analyzers before it, it is then acquisition into the processing software. Now let us go through some of the analyzers. So there are most commonly used uh, analyzers are quadrupole analyzer, ion trap analyzer, time of flight analyzer, and then the last one is the RB trap. So now let us start with the quadrupole analyzer. As the word quadrupole indicates, it has got four poles or the four rods in the instrument. So we apply 
a constant RF to DC voltage to trap the ion. So the important point here is quadrupole acts as a filter for selection of ions for capturing the ions. So you might see single quadrupole instrument where will, there will be only one quadrupole. So you can transfer the ions or you can capture one ion. There are triple quadrupole instruments where the first quadrupole can be used for the transfer of ions. The second quadrupole can act as a fragmentation and the third fragment acts as again the selection of ions. Now the I have introduced a word fragmentation. The word fragmentation indicates fragmenting the molecule to get the structural information. So LCMS is mostly used to obtain the molecular weight or the structural information on the analyte. So the fragmentation is generally called as also called as collision induced dissociation. So you apply a collision energy that is through some organ gas and then you break the molecule. So you fragment the molecule and then obtain its data at the second, quad, third quadruple. So this is about triple quadruple. So triple quadruple contains four rods and you apply, they are interconnected to each other and you apply RF DC voltage to capture the molecule and then fragment it. So remember triple quadrupole can only do fragmentation once. So it is called as MSMS or uh, tandem mass spectrometry. So triple quadrupole gives you nominal mass. So what do I mean by nominal mass? Let's say you have a mo molecule nitrogen, carbon monoxide, ethane, these all compounds have a mass of 28. Now, if you run them through triple quadrupole instruments, you cannot differentiate them because they all have same nominal mass of 28. So this, this is the nominal mass instrument, whereas in an accurate mass instrument like quadrupole time of light or time of light or orbitrap, are accurate mass instruments where it can differentiate even the smaller differences at the first decimal or even second decimal places. We'll go through that in the next slide. So let me take you over through the next mass analyzer, which is ion trap. Ion trap is also a nominal mass analyzer generally. The key difference between quadrupole analyzer, the triple quad to ion trap, trap is ion trap can perform MSN analysis. MSN means it can fragment the molecule n times. So it can fragment multiple times. So in triple quadrupole, it can only fragment to MS2 at the maximum, which is called as MSMS. Here it can fragment till MS3, MS4, MS5, even MS10 it can do. So in ion trap, there are three electrodes. So it's a 3D ion trap. Here, the electrodes are again captured by the, uh, based on the electric field. Since it's an in uh, space, it can capture multiple time. So the significant point here is that ion trap is used for the MSN analysis or uh, multi-stage mass spectrometry, it is also called as. Now we have looked through triple quad as well as ion trap instrument. Now the next is on the time of flight instrument. Now in the time of flight instrument, you have a single quad, which is again to capture the analyte, which then undergoes fragmentation. And the analytes are here separated in a flight tube. As the name indicates, it's a time of flight. So there's a, a tube, if probably, if you see the first slide, which indicates the, oh, sorry, this is the, uh, Uh, Dr. Natraj, you can hear my voice? I can hear you, sir. Continue, sir. Okay, there's some disturbance in the audio. Just Okay. Uh, so here, if you see, this is the time of flight tube in the first slide where the ions are passed through a drift gas in this tube. So, so the amount of time required to reach this is then calculated. As a result, it can even differentiate 
ions of same mass, like the example I have given, carbon monoxide, nitrogen, and ethanes, which all have a mass of 28, but they differ on the sec first decimal or second decimal. Next is the recent introduction is RB trap. Now RB trap combines two things. Here we saw accurate mass, but this cannot do multi-stage mass spectrometry or MSN analysis. Whereas ion trap can do MSN ana analysis, but it won't give accurate mass. Now RB trap combines the ion trap advantage, which is the multi-stage mass spectrometry with the accurate mass giving us a, a much more powerful analytical tool. Now in the RB trap, there are three electrodes, outer electrode and an inner spindle electrode. Now, when, you, when the analytes are captured here, again, based on the voltages, and here they oscillate based on their frequency. So each mass to charge ratio will oscillate at a different frequency and all of them can be captured and do a Fourier transformation to obtain a high, high resolution mass spectrometry with high accuracy. So now the word accuracy means how much close it is towards the exact mass. We will see in the next slide those things. Here, two things, since it is also in space, it can, it can also capture the uh, fragments and do MSN analysis that is still MS2, MS3, MS4 to give rise to a multi-stage mass spectrometry. Currently, RB trap is the one of the highest um, uh, instrument used in the mass spectrometry with a lot of advantages uh, towards the drug discovery uh, and development. Now we have seen through ionization and then how it is analyzed. Now, I have introduced you to a couple of terms, nominal mass and accurate mass. Now let us again revisit them just for the clarity. As you see, these are two different drugs used for various treatments. One of them is an aprosartan, which is an ACE inhibitor, and the other is a statin used for various uh, metabolic uh, disorders like high cholesterol. Now, both of them, as you see, has a mass of 425, 425. However, if you see their second decimal place differs from one to two. Now the accurate mass instrument can differentiate both of them easily. As you see, it is 425.1534, which is a close to the 1530, which is the actual mass based on the, if you can calculate through the carbon hydrogens. And for pravastatin, it is 425.25. Now this compound undergoes, when you do a fragmentation loss of water, again to generate a water loss ion. Here also you can differentiate the mass difference. So as you see, it is accurate mass has gotten very high value in doing many applications because it can differentiate extremely close ions. So this is the accurate mass instrument. Now remember what, so the actual prevastatin mass would be 424, but the MS spectrum will show an ion extra because it's an M plus H. And the other ions you see in this region, these are called as fragment ions or in-source dissociation ions as I described earlier. So this is about the accurate mass. Now let us see some other terminology. This is RX and isotopes. Now, Mass spectrometry will never show you the molecular ion alone. Although we have told that initially it is the molecular ion we observe, but there are some adducts like sodium and potassium because in our mobile phases, there will be always slight amount of sodium or potassium leaching from the glassware or even some of the, uh, from the tubings we use. So here we see again mass of plus 22, which is M plus sodium and plus 16. So you always have to, uh, the students uh, or 
uh, going through the, this presentation should be able to interpret what is the molecular ion and what are its adducts to accurately obtain the information from any mass spectrometry. So it is always based on the differences. So if you see a compound with 22 difference, it's a sodium adduct, and then further 16 is potassium adduct or 38 difference from the molecular ion. So the ability to obtain information in mass spec actually relies, that is one sort of key uh, skill which you can gain is the interpreting the mass spectrometry. Sometimes it's like a puzzle where it is extremely difficult to identify molecular ion. However, through careful interpretation of ions, we can always select the ions. Now, again, these are all the fragment spectra, which give you a key information about the analyte. Now, we have seen what is molecular ion, what is accurate mass, what is nominal mass, and other terminologies. Now, let us also see one more important point in mass spectrometry, which is the isotopic peaks. So if you remember, isotopes have the like the same mass, uh, different mass with the same atomic number. So you have deuterium, which has one isotope, which is M plus H plus one. And then the other isotope is M plus H plus two, which is tritrium. So in always mass spectrum, mass spectrum will also distinguish your deuterium. And also sometimes the 13C carbon present in the molecule. So whenever you run a mass spectra, you also see their isotopes. Now, sometimes the molecular ion is M plus H, that is one proton added. Sometimes there will be two M plus, two protons are added into the molecular ion, which is called as M plus H plus. Now, as I told in the first slide, it is the separation of mass to charge ratio. Now, since you have a charge here, two charges, the molecular ion would be divided by two. So first suppose in this case, if the compound is 564, which is M plus H, if it is a two protons added, it will then divide it by two. Now, remember we also see isotopes that is plus one isotopes because of presence of natural deuterium, 13C carbon, and also sometimes for chlorine and bromine, which has 37 and 81 bromine, which will give you an M plus two peaks because of their presence of natural isotopes. Now, if you have a molecular ion of two protons, you will observe at a difference of 0.5 and the second isotope at one instead of two. So this is one more important point you should always remember while interpreting mass spectra. So you should always zoom the line and see what is their isotopic difference to identify the uh, mass of a peak. Now, sometimes it can be triply charged. In that case, you will see isotopes at the difference of 0.33. If it is a phi charge, you will see a difference of 0.2. So this is one of the important aspects in the mass spectrometry analysis. So now we have gone through isotopic uh, peaks also. This is most important if you have halogen atoms like chlorine and bromine because they have a natural isotopic pattern of M plus two uh, in the ratio of one is to three for chlorine and for bromine one is to one. As you see in this, this clearly shows for you the understanding of isotopes. Uh, the mass is 322. You, when you zoom it, you see a isotope at 23, 24, 25. So this is second isotope will give a key information on the structure of molecules. See, this is around, uh, around sort of 2, 2.5. So this indicates it might have a sulfur in it because sulfur also has some isotopic pattern. Let's say the line is equal to this molecular ion. In that case, you see, you can think that the compound might have a bromine. If it's in a three is to one ratio, then it might be presence of chlorine. So isotope will give a very important information on the structure of the molecule. 
Now, let me take you through another important concept in mass spectrometry, which is MSN. So if you have remembered my initial slide, multi-stage mass spectrometry, also called as MSN, is useful in ion trap, is can be performed in ion trap or RB trap. So just see what is multi-stage mass spectrometry. So whenever you get a molecular ion, you break that through applying collision energy to generate two ions, A and X. You might see all of them initially at MS2 stage only, but you will not know what is the source of, let's say the I ion. It could be formed from W, it could be formed from Y, X. But if you do MSN studies, you can clearly know from where this I ion was generated or where from F ion was generated. Remember, this is only possible through use of either ion trap technology or RB trap instruments. Performing this MSN analysis or the uh, use of this collision energy to, mul to do multi-stage mass spectrometry is ex extremely important to identify any compound like impurities, degradation products. Now, one more, the important section is hydrogen deuterium exchange studies. Now, in LC, we use water as a mobile phase to prepare any buffer. Now, if you use instead of water, deuterium in the mobile phase, what will happen is the labile protons. Now, the word labile here means presence of any protons attached to heteroatom. So NH2 will have two labile protons. OH will have one labile proton. SH will have one labile proton. Now the protons as attached to like methane or methyl will not be labile because they are not attached to a heteroatom. So this labile protons will get exchanged with your deuterium and to see an increase in the mass. Now see in the first experiment, this is atenolol. Atenolol has four labile hydrogens. So when you run the mass spectrometry without deuterium, with only with water and acetonitrile, you see a mass of 267, which is M plus H plus. Now when you run with deuterium, which is 50% deuterium and 50% acetonitrile, you see that the mass is increased by five units, indicating that it might have four labile hydrogens because deuterium has one mass unit extra than proton. Now, some, some might confuse the difference is phi and why do we say four labile hydrogens? You should also account for the molecular ions. So whenever compound ionizes, it takes a proton but in the deuterium mobile phase, it takes a deuterium. So it will add that mass to this. So as always it will be, the difference is four. So now in the, this slide, you can see that if you use a mixture of water and acetonitrile, you always see a uh, various ratios of exchange between the molecules. So it is always important to use a complete deuterium in the mobile phase. And also you should not use a, any mobile phases like methanol, because methanol also has got an heteroatom, which will then back exchange the D2O. So you should always use acetonitrile in these cases. For suppose if your mobile phase contains methanol, in those cases, you should use CD3OD, so which will be much more expensive. So always it is conducted with acetonitrile, which will not have any labile hydrogens. Now we put together all these experiments in any of the uh, case studies we see uh, in the upcoming slides. Now let us also see some experiments or different scan modes in LCMS, mostly used in metabolite identification. Now, this is mostly done in triple quadruple experiments. So now in the ion source, that is electrospray ionization or the APCI, all the ions are passed into the uh, first quadruple in a triple quad instrument. 
Now, if you fix one mass here, that means if you if you instruct the uh, instrument to capture one mass, so it will adjust the RF DC voltage to capture that mass. So in those cases, you capture the mass, do collision induced dissociation, and then scan at the triple quadrupole to get a spectrum. This is called as product ion scan because you are getting the product fragmentation information from the one particular ion you have selected. So in so if you go back to just one previous slide, in multi-stage mass spectrometry or even in um, a triple quadrupole, you select here one ion and to generate MS2, which is called as uh, product ion spectrum because you are capturing one ion and you're instructing instrument to capture one ion. Now you can slightly modify it to get a precursor ion scan. Now in this case, you will say fix Q3. You can say that I want an, uh, I want to capture all the ions coming from LC into ion source, which will generate a fragment of let's say 200. So you will only see the spectra where Q1 will only provide you spectra where this fragment is formed. In some compounds, this fragment may not have been formed. So you won't see those camp compounds. So precursor ion scan is used to scan the precursors what you want. Now you will see these applications in the later cases, but just wanted to give you a brief outline. I will also go through when we do the application part. The other is neutral loss scan. So as the term indicates, neutral loss. So here, Again, all ions are passed. In Q3 also all ions are passed, but you will only see a spectra with a difference. Let's say if your compound undergoes a fragmentation to give a loss of water, which is 18. So you can instruct your mass spectrometer to capture all ions with the difference with 18. So only those pair of ions which show M by Z 18 difference will capture. This is extremely important in metabolite identification. Now, MRM mode, which is called as multiple reaction monitoring, are also called as like uh, selector reaction monitoring also, depending on the ions you use. Now, this is another variation of uh, mass spec, wherein you capture the, you always fix what is Q1, and you also fix Q3. So this is mostly used for quantification experiments because you you know what what to like what ion to look in Q1 and what ion to look at Q3. Now this increases the sensitivity. Now these tools are extremely important to apply for any uh, metabolite ID or any of the case studies. So you have to always remember that. Each of the applications may you may need to use different technologies. So we have to understand what technology we have to use in particular instance. Now with that, I will uh, go through the some of the papers uh, we have written. So if somebody wants to take a look uh, in like in depth of these uh, introduction, uh, please go through these uh, papers so that you can better appreciate. Uh, the uh, mass spectrometry tools and how to perform uh, various experiments. So with this introduction, let me start with some case studies. So now we have gone through what is mass spectrometry? What are various types of mass spectrometers? What different type of ionization source we can use? What sort of experiments we can do by modifying the options we have in the mass spectrometry instrument to obtain the information. Now, let me start with first case study, which is impurities identification, impurities or degradation products identification. Now, whenever a tablet is made or any API is made or any pharmaceutical product is made, there are always going to be impurities which are nothing but byproducts in the synthetic process. Now, degradation products are the products generated during storage, which can be like if you store at a heat, 
at a temperature humidity or also can be formed at normal storage conditions. And that is the reason you have an expiry for any pharmaceutical product, because if one of the impurity exceeds their limit, you have to sort of, you cannot use the product because of their toxicity. So in pharmaceutical industry, identifying impurities and degradation products are extremely important because they have effect on quality, effect on efficacy, and toxicity. So as you see, these are the notifications issued by the regulatory authority, US FDA. So most of the times, if you go through any US FDA website, you will see many of the products are recalled from the market because of presence of impurities or failed impurities or degradation specifications. And this can bring huge losses to the manufacturer. So controlling the impurities needs first identification of those impurities. To identify them, we generally use mass spectrometry and then sometimes even NMR also. So one of the important uh, applications we see in industry is the characterization of impurities degradation products by LCMS. As I indicated in my introduction slide, you're going to use a mixture of tools or combination of various tools to identify the impurities. Sorry. Now, this is how we use the how to characterize impurities by LCMS. So now you see the combination of all the experiments we I have discussed in the initial side. So initially you do work on time of flight uh, study instrument to get the molecular ion and their fragments. So here you can do two ways. Since you know the drug mass, you can directly infuse the drug to get the ionization mode and polarity. So some compounds may ionize in electrospray ionization, some compounds may ionize in, in APCI mode. Now the term ionization means that you should be able to see M plus H or M plus sodium or M potassium adduct. Now polarity, what do you mean by polarity? Polarity is either you select positive ion mode or negative ion mode. So you can use positive mode if you contain amine or a OH of those functional groups. For suppose if you have a carboxylic acid, COOH, then you may need to say, select negative mode. Then you need to optimize instrument parameters because you want to know how to get the highest intense molecular ion. Now, once you get the accurate mass, so accurate mass you get through either time of flight or arbitrap instruments. Then you do the calculate the molecular formula. So once you know the accurate mass, the software can predict the formula for the uh, fragment or the molecular ion because you can input this number of carbons. So software will do permutation and combinations with the least error that is very close to the accurate mass till the third or fourth decimal point to generate a molecular formula. Then we do MSN studies, which is multi-stage mass spectrometry to understand the origin of fragment, that is where from that fragment has been obtained. Then you do hydrogen deuterium exchange studies to determine the accurate, uh, to determine the labile hydrogens in both drug and drug degradation products. And you establish fragmentation pathway. So initially you do, do for the drug because it's a pure compound. Then you do for any impurities sample where you run through LCMS because your sample is not pure. Now what will happen? The impurities will get separated in the LC column and each for each impurity, you will obtain the molecular ion and its fragments along with hydrogen, labile hydrogens. Once you know the accurate mass, labile hydrogens and its fragmentation pathway, you can propose the structure for this impurity, which then can be synthesized or further confirmed by NMR. So LCMS is actually always the first technique to use in these cases. Now, let me show you a case study of Silazapril. Now, Silazapril is 
uh, again, uh, ACE inhibitor are used in the treatment of hypertension. Now you see, as I told earlier, Silazopril has a like mass of 418, which is M plus H. But here, if you see, there is no molecular ion. I have labeled for the clarity, but in, in actual system, you only see peaks at 418, 440, 456, and just the fragment ions. So you, you see if you, there's a difference of 16 based on that, I could interpret that the molecular ion is 418 and its sodium reduct is 440. And this potassium reduct is 456, which matches with the accurate mass because here you can see that there are four decimals with which we can predict what is the molecular ion. Now, this is obtained on a TOF instrument. So as you see in spectra, we don't know where from 137 is obtained. If you see a small ion labeled as J, because it could have come directly from 418, it could have come from 211, it could have come from 189, it could have come from 169. Now, also one more point in the insert, if you see, is there are two ions of mass 183. But if you run this in a nominal mass instrument, like a single quad, you will not be able to differentiate because the spectrum will only produce 183 one line. But since this is an accurate mass instrument, it can even differentiate peaks from just with a difference of 0 0.03 to produce two ions. So you will know that what these two ions, because each ion can give you a different structural in information. Now in the accurate mass that is MS TOF instrument, you cannot do a multi-stage or MSN analysis. So then we have done the MSN analysis to understand where from each of the fragments are obtained. Now, if you see the 418, which is molecular ion, if we capture, we see a compound at 211, which is the fragment ion. So this 211 has also got sodium adduct and also potassium adduct again with a difference of 22 and 38 from 211 or 16 from the sodium adduct. Now 211 gives again 183, 169, 165, 143 and all other ions. Now, if you capture 183, you will get 165, 137. So now this gives a clear indication that which fragment is obtained from which other fragment. So in multi-stage mass spectrometry, the compound can initially fragment to one ion. This ion can further break into another ion. So it is a continuous process. So the all the fragments, if you can interpret, then you can lay out a fragmentation pathway. Now, if you see, this is the fragmentation pathway of Silazapril. Now in the brackets, there's a one more mass indicated, which is called as uh, the HD mass, that is when you run with deuterium. So in this case, there are three labile hydrogens and you see a mass of plus three, which is 421. So now we could lay out the mass fragmentation pathway. So you know what is 211 ion based on the accurate mass. So you will know, okay, this, this part, this sort of 211 belongs to this region. Now you can lay out all other fragmentation, like from 211, there is a loss of CO and loss of ethylene. As I told, both the losses are 28, which is 16 plus 12. But if you can see the software can differentiate, the instrument can differentiate. There is an ethene loss, the C2H4 ethane, and there's a carbon monoxide loss. And you see there's a difference in the decimal point of 183, which you which I showed in the earlier inset, which is which only difference differs by 0 0.03. So with the application of accurate mass as well as the multi-stage mass spectrometry, you can lay out all the fragments observed in the uh, mass spectrum. So this is one of the key skills uh, you have to gain uh, to do the pharmaceutical like MET-ID or degradation products identification. Now, once you lay out this fragmentation process, you can then easily characterize degradation products. Now, in the next slide, this is the chromatogram showing separation of silazopril degradation products. So initially we run through LC. Generally we develop a H 
PLC method initially because we need to separate the impurities through LC. Now, once you separate the degradation products through HPLC, you then uh, send them into mass spectrometry. So you need not use LCMS initially. You can just use HPLC connected with a PDA to separate these instruments. So this is a gradient program. If you see, we initially use phosphate buffer for separation, but in LCMS, you can't use phosphate buffer because it's a non-volatile buffer. So we replace phosphate buffer with ammonium formate with the same pH and then run an LCMS analysis to identify all these impurities. So, so in LCMS, each of these impurities is then transferred to mass spectrometer to identify the mass and then to characterize its structure. So now let us see some of the characterization work on Silazo April. Now we see a mass of, this is Cl3, which you have seen here, which is this moiety. Now Cl3 has a mass of 251. Again, see in this case, I haven't labeled it, but when you see the mass spectrum, you have to now interpret. So there's a 16 difference, which is sodium to potassium and 229 is the molecular ion. So based on the difference, we could calculate that 229 is actual molecular ion, not 251 or 267. Now you see a mass of 211. That means we already characterized what is 211 in the earlier slide. So if you see, this is the 211 fragment ion, which is observed in drug substance that is API and also in the impurity. That means this part is same in the both drug and degradation product. So this indicates that there is no change in this moiety because you already know what is the structure of 211. Since you know the structure of 211, you, will know, you can then say that the difference is only in this region which is nothing but there is some change. Now, the molecular ion is 229 in this case. So now this difference, 211 to 229 is 18. So what could be 18? 18 is a water loss. So that means there is a OH attached in this position. So this complete moiety is lost in the Cl3 and the impurity might be this one. So it matches the accurate mass of 229 and there's a water loss, which is 18. So based on that, you can now interpret that the structure of this could be this one. So once you lay down the fragmentation pathway, you will compare the fragments observed in the impurity to the fragments observed in API. So from based on their differences, so some ions will be similar, some ions will not be. So in this case, 211 was similar. So that indicates this ring moiety, the, uh, the uh, it's not an aromatic ring, but it's an uh, aliphatic uh, seven-membered ring is constant. So the change could have only happened in this region and based on that, we could predict. Now let us see one more uh, case study also, one more impurity ID. This is CL5, which is, the impurity we have seen in this case. So in the CL5, when we send it to mass spec, you see a mass of 390. In this case, you could see a good molecular ion. So sodium adduct is 412 and potassium adduct is 428. So all these are done on positive mode. Now, important thing is, again, you can see 211 here, probably a little bit blurred, but you can still see 211. So again, this indicates this, this moiety is constant, that is the seven-membered pyridazine or the nitrogen moiety is still uh, intact in the impurity. Now, the only difference could be in this region. Now, the compound indicates from the API mass, if you remember, the API mass is 418. So the difference is 28 from 418 to 390. So now this difference corresponds to 28 units difference. Now this 28 could be loss of CO or loss of ethane, C2H4.
but accurate mass clearly indicates that it is the difference is C to H4. Now you can understand that the change has happened in the ester moiety where the ester group has hydrolyzed to generate a carboxylic acid. So based on this, you can again identify the impurity. So these are some of the case studies, some of the uh, practical uh, points during the impurity identification. So you have to be able to lay down the fragmentation pathway, interpret the fragments, and based on the difference between the accurate mass of the impurity or degradation product, you can predict the structure of the impurities. I hope you all were able to follow the this case study. Now, this is the paper uh, we could publish in Journal of Pharmaceutical and Biomedical. Uh, if somebody is interested, uh, please have a look uh, to understand. So as I said, LCMS is the initial, and then you do multi-stage uh, mass spectrometry with LCMS, and, and then you do NMR and LCNMR to further characterize. Always remember that mass spectrometry is the first point because you have to know what is the molecular weight of the impurity. Without that, it is extremely difficult even to characterize by NMR because you won't be able to set the integration or integrals in NMR without the mass of uh, moiety in LCMS. Uh, with this uh, case study, now let us shift to the next case study in as metabolites identification. So now we have seen the identification of impurities which are generated during the storage of any pharmaceutical product like tablet, uh, capsules, suspensions in normal environmental conditions or during these stress studies like acid-base, uh, light oxidation. Now metabolites are, when you take any drug, it gets metabolized in our body by either by mostly by liver, but also by other uh, organs, by various SIP mediated enzymes to generate metabolites. Now, it is important to understand what metabolites are formed because some of the metabolites are reactive in nature. One important point is actually in drug discovery is that it is the toxic metabolites that make the drug not useful to a patient. That is, we can't progress it to a further uh, stages because it generates some sort of toxic metabolites uh, and which might have a predominant impact on any of the organs. So you should always know what metabolites are formed. If the toxic metabolites are formed, then you will inform the medicinal chemistry team or to do a structural activity related SAR again to modify that site so that it don't produce the toxic metabolites. So the important here is that we need to do meta-ID to understand what metabolites are formed in human body when you take the drug. Sometimes these might be reactive metabolites. Sometimes there is also a potential to do a enzyme inhibition and induction potential. So you would have read in pharmacology or medicinal chemistry that there's a CYP3A4 induction or inhibition if you take two drugs together. So we should not use two drugs. So that all informations are generally gathered through this uh, sort of performing various experiments in LCMS. So there are a lot of experiments you can do in this metabolism studies. So one of them we will go through, which is metabolite identification. Now, so how do you do metabolite ID by LCMS? So metabolism is generally occurs through hydroxylation, that is addition of OH or demethylation. So if there's any methyl group like N-methyl or O-methyl, that generally losses O demethylation. N oxidation, so if you have a nitrogen that gets oxidized, so you have a halogenation which is the loss of uh, halogen moiety, then there are some glucouronide conjugations. So generally these metabolites are either eliminated in urine or in feces. So understanding uh, these metabolites helps us to know how the drug is eliminated. So that is where you can calculate the half-lives and also do pharmacokinetic studies. So you should know, so 
mass spectrometry is one of the key tools again used for the metabolite. So one you can know by based on the accurate mass. And second is through the losses we can observe during MSN analysis. Sometimes there's a carboxylic acid formation. Let's say if there's an alcohol aldehyde. So in those cases, you will see a loss of 44 Daltons in negative mode. Now this glucouronide conjugation will make the metabolite into more polar water soluble. Now, if there are some extremely reactive metabolites, you see a glutathione conjugation or N-acetylcysteine conjugation naturally in the body, which are amino acids, which are then eliminated, uh, which are easily eliminated through urine. So again, these can be characterized in the LCMS based on their specific losses. Now, again, I will go through the importance of accurate mass because in metabolite ID, let's say take the case of nephazedone. So nephazedone can generate two fragments with the same mass, which is 237. Again, differing in just there in the second decimal, which is 11 versus 15. So accurate mass instrument can differentiate. The reason this is important is the oxidation can happen at this uh, ring or the oxidation can also happen in this ring also or the metabolite ID. Now, if you know the accurate mass, you can differentiate because the 237 can be formed from, from this piety also or this mighty also from the triazole ring also or from this heteroatom ring. So you need to do accurate mass analysis to understand from which, which moiety is the actual 237. So you can see this is the experimental mass, which is 1148, which is much closer to 1153. So this is the um, uh, fragment this is formed. So when you do metabolism analysis, probably ox uh, this oxidation could have happened in this region. So you can easily predict based on the accurate mass where the oxidation has happened. Now, we have again seen importance of accurate mass even in metabolite identification. Now, one more thing, case study is HD exchange. So if you remember in hydrogen deuterium exchange experiments, you re replace the water with D2O. So all the labile hydrogens gets ex ex uh, exchanged with the deuterium. So in NH2, you have two labile hydrogens. That is its mass when you run through LC HD exchange analysis with deuterium, it increases by two units. Now, when the metabolite formation occurs, there are the UCA meta, meta, metabolite with a mass of 406, which is a difference of two units. So these are dehydrogenated metabolites. Now there are two options to form dehydrogenated metabolite. One of them is the formation of alpha to nitrogen. Two protons can be eliminated during metabolism by any of the SIP enzymes to generate a double bond. Another is this NH3 can cyclize with this uh, ring to generate a sort of this sort of cyclized structure. Now, if you clearly see that now the heteroatoms are changed. Here there are three heteroatoms because we did not lose any hydrogen from heteroatom. But in this case, the second possibility, the heteroatom has lost. So one heteroatom from here was lost. So here it is in protonated moiety. Here it is not. So when you see this one, it should be NH3 plus. So it will be one proton also added while you do LCMS. Here it's already protonated, so you see only two. Now, if the first metabolite was formed, there will not be any change in the HD exchange experiments because the number of labile hydrogens are same both in drug as well as the metabolite one. If the metabolism would have happened through the ring formation where amine would have cyclized in this case, there will be one hydrogen less from the heteroatom. So as a result, you can easily distinguish which metabolite was formed. So this is one of the important application in metabolite ID. Now, I have taken you through constant neutral loss scan in the earlier section. But 
let me go through it with a case study so as i indicated if there is any reactive metabolite it forms a glutathione conjugate now if the glutathione conjugate was formed you will always see a neutral loss of 129 daltons because this corresponds to this moiety of uh, glutathione moiety where this is eliminated to form 129 daltons so let's say if you want to run now let me take you over through the introduction uh, case study how we going to run this constant neutral loss scan during methyd now this is the neutral loss scan so now you will say mass spectrometer whenever you run give me all products or all the impurities all the metabolites with a difference of 129 so once you run it will only capture between the metabolite to its fragment with a difference of 129 so in that way so you will scan q1 scan q3 but you will instruct instrument that if there is a difference of 129 between the ion molecular ion to fragment ion give as a peak so based on that the software will or the instrument will produce whatever the glutathione conjugates are so again so all whatever the case it is we going to discuss those are mostly based on the in initial experiments we have discussed in the negative mode again you see a common fragment which is 272 in the negative mode so again you will tell mass spec to capture any ion with those difference now we will see another case study how we going to use another um, experiment another type of experiment which is mrm mode so in mrm mode as i told earlier you will capture both the ions so now you take the testosterone which is a natural hormone present in our body so testosterone gets metabolized with addition of hydroxy 16 units but there are multiple sites which can add hydroxy so it can be hydroxy at beta position 2 beta 16 beta as you know the testosterone contains the cholesterol ring so now what we do in mrm mode is let me again go through that slide for the clarity now in mrm mode you again fix your q1 which is the mass you need to obtain the mass you need to obtain is the whatever the molecular ion of testosterone now q3 you will say that plus 16 because there is only addition of hydroxy now the mass spectrometer will capture whatever the ions which will give i with addition of plus 16 so all the uh, metabolites with the plus 16 addition will be captured as a result you can see all the compounds with the addition of plus 16 so now you see at different retention times different hydroxy but all of them may have same masses but they are separated chromatographically and this can be captured just by one experiment so in metabolite id you have to use various sort of experiments because in metabolites you collect either blood urine or feces and then run the analysis so what will happen is they are extremely in low concentration so you have to perform either mrm mode neutral loss scans along with the accurate mass to identify various metabolite there can be an oxidation also so those metabolite will also be generated here now you have to distinguish these metabolites based on msn analysis or multi stage mass spectrometry where the fragments will be separated so based on the fragmentation path where you going to identify where the sample is uh, where the metabolic change has happened so i would uh, recommend you guys to in case of somebody of you are interested uh, to take a look at one of the article written in our lab uh, regarding the methyd now we have seen mostly qualitative analysis or characterization experiments now another case study which is extremely important in uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry is genotoxic impurities quantification now what are genotoxic impurities during synthesis we generate lot of 
carcinogen impurities which are called as genotoxic because they may have a potential to uh, sort of like uh, produce a cancer in a patient if their levels are uh, more than some ppm limit so generally these needs to be controlled in the drug substance to a limit of one ppm that is one parts per million which equates to let's say one milligram in one kilogram of a material so sometimes fda regulates them extremely stringent so in some of the cases it could be 0.2 ppm which is 0.2 milligrams in one kilogram of material so you have to able to quantify them at such a low level again mass spectrometry is a tool of choice so generally genotoxic impurities are either predicted through in silico or aims test because there are softwares which based on the uh, structural alerts like if there's an amine or sulfonic acid boronic acid or aldehyde which are initially tagged as a genotoxic impurities nitro group hydrazine so once you know which genotoxic impurities remember this is a quantification experiment so you know what are the genotoxic impurities now you need to quantify them so you need not use an accurate mass instrument in this case because there is no use we are not characterizing the impurity rather we are quantifying the impurity so in this case we generally use either quadrupole instrument that is single quad or triple quad depending on the mode you use so so this is the general strategy we use you select the limit based on the daily dose you select a suitable technique and then you optimize again polarity adx fragments then you establish various method parameters like lod loq now let us see a case study from one of the uh, drug so this is an imitinab mesylate so there are two uh, genotoxic impurities produced in this drug one is called as mpba or pnmb the other is so these are the structures of two genotoxic impurities so this is imatinib mesylate and the other is the mpba which has this moiety methyl and the another genotoxic pnpb now you know both the masses one of them mass is 234 so when you analyze you see a mass of 235 another impurity genotoxic has a mass of 278 so if you run in a full scan mode so what you do in full scan mode you will say to mass spectrometer scan completely that is you won't set any sort of uh, any sort of conditions or any sort of limits now you should see the the baseline is very noisy although you can see the peaks it is pretty noisy now now what you say to mass spectrometer especially for single quad you can say capture an ion with a mass of 235 daltons that's it it will not it will only capture the any compound with mass of 235 only as a result all your baseline noise gets cleared because you have instructed the mass spectrometer to capture only 235 similarly for pnmb you ask the mass spectrometer to capture 278 so in this cases it is always advantageous to use quadrupole instruments because they can capture the ion so they can hold the ion whereas in msn instruments will not be beneficial in this case so depending on the experiment or depending on the application you have to choose your choice of technique carefully now this is sim mode which is also selected ion recording or selected ion monitoring so you are monitoring one selected ion now this is the sensitivity at 100 nanogram level L remember that the gtis needs to be controlled at such a low level that is parts per million that means 1 ppm corresponds to 1 milligram in a kilogram now sometimes you need to go at to do a much more lower limits for these gtis then you use mrm now what you are saying to software you see earlier we told software to capture any ion with a mass of 235 now you are saying capture any ion with a molecular ion of 235 and also which gives a fragment of 134 so this still clears your baseline because there might be something with 235 in the sample but that may not give again 134 so this still decreases the sensitivity of analyte 
in this case you can see that the lod was 0.0051 nanograms per ml so you can see how much sensitivity uh, you can get through this mrm mode similarly for another genotoxic you say capture an analyte with a mass of 28 which is molecular ion which gives a fragment of 105 so the you may in your lc you may see any compounds with 278 but it may not give the fragment of 105 so mrm mode still enhances your sensitivity because the baseline is much more clear so sensitivity in this case is always defined by signal to noise ratio signal is the response you see in the mass spec or in any instrument and noise the baseline noise or the whatever the disturbance you see in the uh, when you record an instrument output so by selection of appropriate mode you can characterize them to such a low level so again this is one of the quantification tool so ne the next case study is bioanalysis again you so bioanalysis involves the pharmacokinetic analysis. So generally, you would like to know before a drug is delivered into market, how it is eliminated, how much time it, was, it stays in the blood, how, what are its pathways, how much drug is it eliminated in urine, how much drug is eliminated through uh, bile, feces, so, and how much time it stays in the blood. So based on that, you will give the doses. Sometimes the doses might be one tablet per day or sometime it could be four tablets so you all those data area under curve you can get through this pharmacoanalysis. analysis again lcms is the preferred choice so as i told you almost all application whatever industrial applications or any applications you take will depend on the basic experiments we discussed in the initial slide so this is one where we inject borinol to rat and then get its plasma, centrifuge and separate all the proteins, extract the drug into the solution and run an LC-MS-MS analysis. Again, you can capture the borinol either through SIM mode where you can say the mass of borinol or an MRM mode where M plus H plus and a specific fragment ion. And then you can understand what is the drug mean uh, half-life area under the curve. So based on this, you can again uh, know oh, how much time the drug needs to eliminate or takes time to eliminate through urine or uh, feces and how much dosing you need to give. So this is about the pharmacokinetics. Now I would like you to go through another important topic, although this is not an industrial application, but one of the most important concern is pharmaceuticals in environment. So there are a lot of pharmaceuticals which can generate in environment. So you may think how pharmaceuticals end up in environment. How do they get into water or air? So whenever the pharmaceuticals are synthesized, the effluents from the, those synthetic industries are generally dumped, although they have to undergo a treatment, but sometimes that may not be accurate. And they are just dumped into many of the water resources. Another is through the drugs we take. More, many of us may not remember how many drugs uh, people in general take these days. So all these drugs through whatever we take are eliminated in either urine or feces and again go to the sewage plant. Remember that these drugs may not be excreted as such but based on sometimes as a metabolites. Now as you see you see a lot of drugs entering into the water cycle and they mostly end up in drinking water. In fact, a lot of research has been now dedicated to understand what are the drugs are already present in the water and how we can uh, remove them. So, in fact, uh, if you have to say some of the water we drink might already have few drugs uh, we take. So those might come either from the pharmaceutical industry where the wastes are uh, generated or uh, sent to uh, passed on to the rivers or sometimes even lakes, especially in uh, underdeveloped countries where there are no guidelines how to dispose or even through the excretion of the drugs, what we take. And sometimes they, these excreted drugs are then uh, sort of goes through sewage treatment. They may end up in plants, even in poultry. And these again end up in drinking water. 
although the amount of drug we get in drinking water might be very less, they might have a significant impact on aquatic animals. Now, if you see in an, a study conducted in US, the traces of pharmaceutical chemicals and hormones have been detected in drinking water of 14% of nation, that is whatever 14% of people generally drink water containing some sort of chemical or 41 million in American areas. Although this might have a minor impact on humans, but this will have a huge impact on the aquatic resources or on the uh, birds. So this is, see, there's a diclofenac poisoning as a cause of vulture population because these vultures have died because of the presence of diclofenac getting into the water and by drinking this uh, diclofenac containing water. And also one of them, uh, which is a very good cartoon, which describes the uh, significance or importance of pharmaceuticals getting contaminated in water. You can see a fish and a fish is uh, pregnant sarcastically and says that whether it's a boy or a girl, now the other fish replies, actually it is both because of serious effects of pharmaceutical and aquatic life, including sex change and anorexia. So, there's a lot of impact of this pharmaceuticals getting into water. Now, this has received a lot of attention in various international journals also. So we have also conducted a study in Niper uh, to see what are the um, pharmaceutical present in our, um, in the area of Niper Mohali, Niper Chandigarh. So we collected water samples from various areas and then we prepare uh, samples through solid phase extraction. Now we do identification by based on MRM transition. You know what is MRM by now. So you'd select a molecular ion and then you select a fragment so that you will know uh, quant confidently that which drug is present in the sample. Now you further confirm by doing MSMS analysis and through accurate mask and you quantitate by using MRM transition, which we just saw in GTM. So we have picked the samples in nearby Chandigarh area, and we could see that there was a contamination in some of the areas. So there was two drugs observed in the water samples, although at a nanogram levels. One of them is diclofenac, famous uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug used as a painkiller. Another is pitavastatin, which is used as a uh, sort of uh, used in a cholesterol decreasing drug. So based on this, you could say that, that there are pharmaceuticals even in uh, our uh, water we drink in the Chandigarh area. So based on this, we could uh, also written an article, Pollution of Aqueous Mattresses in Pharmaceutical. This is in a book chapter. Uh, if somebody is interested, please have a look on this. And another is how to do a systematic strategy for identification of pharmaceutical environment through LCMS tools. So again, LCMS is the, the choice of technique. So whatever can be the uh, problem, you use the same experiments as I have defined in my introduction. Now, let me shift the gears quickly to some of the complex uh, challenges. So one of them is biologics. Now we saw small molecule metid, small molecule impurity identification, but mass spectrometry can also provide for biologics or large molecules. So what are biologics? Let us see the difference first. So let's say ibuprofen. This is the small molecule which is used as a painkiller. Now see its size as compared to a biologics. Biologics are natural monoclonal antibodies. It could be a proteins or even sometimes peptides. So these biologics, this is a monoclonal antibody. Biologics, see it's a pretty big structure as you have read in earlier uh, things that biologics uh, have a heavy chain and light chain, uh, which, are con which are linked through disulfide link. So nowadays biologics are mostly used uh, in the treatment of various diseases, starting from cancer to uh, immunological disorders. Now, how do we going to characterize them? Because they are in, the molecules are now in 1.6, like they are in kilo Daltons, not like 400, 500, but their masses are sometimes in uh, like 165,000 or 165,000 or 1 million. So how do we going to characterize, how do we going to get mass? Uh, 
Now remember mass is a mass to charge ratio. So these large molecules contains lot of heteroatoms and they get charged. That means, that means they take lot of charges. That means it will be M plus 12H. That means there are 12 charges. So as a result, the mass gets divided by 12. As a result, you can still see the masses, but you need to do some sort of deconvolution. So this labeling is done by, uh, so the software will then deconvolute to obtain the mass of moiety. Now let's say 20. So that means there are 20 protons added and the mass will get divided by 20 as always. As I indicated earlier, mass spectrometry detects mass to charge ratio, which is M by Z ion. Now, this is how we can detect large molecules. Now, let me take you through one of the uh, important uh, topic, which is proteomics. Now, proteomics involves identification of proteins in the samples or in any of the uh, in any of the biological systems. So in proteomics, you isolate a protein. So some of the proteins you may say, now you're uh, listening for COVID, there's a spike protein in the virus, which attaches to the ACE uh, receptor, which is again a protein to elect a uh, immunolo or to infect the patient, and then uh, which cascades the immune reactions. Now, to identify the protein, how you do is that you isolate the protein mixture. In the, there are three techniques you can do. One is top-down proteomics, middle-down proteomics, and bottom-up approach. Now, the, as the name indicates, the top-down. In top-down, you just separate the proteins and then fragment the protein. Based on the fragmentation variety of protein, you identify the protein sequence in intact mass. Remember that the protein might be below 50 kilo daltons, but it may take up 100 charts or 200 protons. As a result, it still gets into the range of mass spec and then based on the deconvolution. So the deconvolution involves deconvoluting where the process involves identification of molecular ion or mass of the moiety based on the software calculations. Now, in a middle down approach, you digest. The word digestion here means you break the protein into smaller fragments by using some enzymes like trypsin, lysine. You know where the trypsin cleaves the protein. Now you generate peptides. These peptides are then separated by again LCMS. Here you see that the peptide can be even 20,000 Daltons. Now what again you do is you get the peptide mass now you all again club together, that is you fit all the peptides and then you will know what protein has formed. Generally bottom-up proteomics is the most used because you break the protein mixture into hundreds of peptides by using known enzymes. So once you digest, you will know where the digestion has happened or where the cleavage has happened if you use the known enzymes like trypsin, lysine. Then you separate the peptides using LC and then you do the MS analysis of these peptides to get intact mass and then do MS-MS analysis to get the peptide information. Now, again, all this information is then we transcribe back to get what is the mass of protein and what protein was formed. So you see that in top-down proteomics, you don't have a mass limit, whereas in bottom-up, whereas in top-down, you have a limit because in top down you are not breaking protein and mass spectrometer has to see an individual see a complete picture which makes it difficult sometimes to interpret the data so sometimes you use a, all the three approaches to identify protein so in bottom up you can do all the peptides whereas in middle down you digest the biologics or the moiety into a light chain and heavy chain which then can be identified through uh, lcms again the technique is similar whatever the basic experiments I have defined in the earlier stage, do a LCMS to accurate mass and do MSMS analysis to peptide. So the important challenge is to how do you interpret the data? So that makes the uh, interpretation as a skill. So if you learn that skill, you can easily do uh, most of this experiment. Now, characterization of biosimilars. Now, what are biosimilars? 
generally we you would have heard the name generics generic is for a small molecule whereas for a biologics it's called as a biosimilar in generics for a innovator moiety you manufacture same compound and you release which are called as generics whereas in biosimilar these are biologics similar but not exactly similar because biologics are produced by a complex process uh, where through the uh, through the fermentation as well as cell culture so you cannot always get the same product but you should at least show similarity so again lcms is the choice of technique so you run again the innovator mo molecule you run a biosimilar that is the exactly similar to innovator so generally you release the biosimilar moiety once the patents are expired. So before patents expire, you cannot release a biosimilar. So biosimilars decrease the cost of molecules. So that is why many uh, companies uh, manufacture these biosimilars because they are, you need not innovate it, but rather you need to manufacture into a similar product with same efficacy and uh, uh, purity. So to understand how pure it is, you have to again run in LCMS and you see that you will have to compare, this is the mass of the uh, biosimilar innovator versus the uh, biosimilar moiety. As you see in biosimilars, you don't get a single peak like we saw in small molecules because there is a variation called as glycans attached to this biosimilars where carbohydrate moieties are attached. Now these carbohydrate moieties are, there are mass spectrometry, again, differentiate based on their mass. Now for the biosimilar, you have to see that the amount of these variations are exactly similar or lower than innovator. As you see, all these peaks are much lower except the main uh, moiety in the biosimilar. So you have to, again, for FDA, you have to submit all this data and you do through it the accurate mass instrument. This is again, there's a, this is called as a mirror plot where you overlay one innovator with biosimilar based on the accurate mass studies. Now, I have told you peptide mapping in this where you digest and generate peptides during this process in bottom approach. So I would like to show you one case study where these peptides are now separated through LC. So you, this is a cryptic digest. The herceptin is one of the uh, my, uh, drug used for uh, cancer, I believe. These herceptin is now digested by LCMS. So you are not measuring the herceptin, but you are measuring the peptides derived from the herceptin. So peptides are amino acids, which are much lower in length. That is, there can be 10 to 20 or at the max 50 amino acids. So now you separate these amino acids through LC. Now you compare both for originator and biosimilar. So again, you have to use an LCMS analysis and you have to show to regulatory authorities that, that the biosimilar or whoever is the manufacturer that the, it is comparable to originator. So again, an application of LCMS, not only in small molecules, but even biologics. So now you see, this is the, let me zoom it a bit. Now this is the various chromatograms you see. Now you obtain the moiety mass and you get the sequence. Now this sequence is one to 19. Now this is also a same sequence one to 19 only with a mass of 1862. Now you compare both these masses, there's a loss of water. That means this is an impurity generated in LCM, in generated in your sample, which is a pyroglutamic acid. Now see the another peptide, which is, which is a sequence from 51 to 59. Now this is an, there's only one mass difference, which is a deamidation. We'll see what deamidation is. So in biologics, there are a lot of post-translational modifications. Now, what do I mean by post-translational modification? Whenever any enzyme or protein is synthesized in, in our body, it undergoes a lot of modifications in its side chain. It might be in the amount of carbohydrates it gets attached or the amount of changes, let's say deamidation, oxidation of cysteine, oxidation of methionine or deamidation. So all this may be very minor 
changes, but has a huge impact on the uh, on the activity of medicine and also activity of on the protein which we have in our bodies. So this is how we do a peptide digestion and then interpret the data. So as, as you have seen, the mass spectrometry is, uh, involves a lot of interpretation of data, but if you can do the interpret, if you like doing solving puzzles, that makes uh, much more interesting. Now, one of the another important, uh, not may not be in pharmaceutical industry, but in the uh, general understanding of pathophysiology of diseases. So many of the diseases we see, maybe cancer, maybe uh, any other uh, metabolic disorders may involve slight change in the proteins. So these proteins modification may have a huge impact on the normal functioning of the organs. Now see, this is one example, amino acid epimerization. So in our eye, human eye, there's one protein called as crystalline and the crystalline protein undergoes isomerization. That is, you would have heard an amino acid called as asparagine. This amino acid undergoes uh, through the formation of succinamide intermediate where this NH2, uh, this NH moiety attacks onto this carbonyl and forms succinamide intermediate. And when it hydrolyzes, it forms carboxylic acid. Now there are two variations where the hydrolysis happens, whether the hydrolysis happen at this point or hydrolysis happen. If the hydrolysis happens at this, it is called as aspartic acid. If the hydrolysis happens, it's called as isoaspartic acid. Now this is only a change of one mass unit in the amino acid. If you have remembered, proteins can have a mass of thousands of kilodaltons, but just one small change of one amine replaced by one OH can have huge impact, a catastrophic impact on the human organ or human body, which may not enable them to function. Again, mass spectrometry can clearly distinguish these differences to understand the pathophysiology of diseases, how uh, the diseases are generated, not only on that, but another is on the uh, cancer, identification of pathophysiology of cancer. So in, the, in this case, we have uh, sort of, uh, you can see in this case study, there are four prostate uh, cancer patients. Now in the cancer, uh, there are benign, which is like, which doesn't harm the patient, but there are some which is uh, tumor, which is metastatic tumors. Now in this metastatic tumors will have a different protein or some minor change in the proteins or even the amount of proteins expressed. So in all these cancers or in various diseases, some proteins might be overexpressed or underexpressed, thereby changing our natural body or natural organ to function its way. As a result, this produced a lot of uh, sort of different uh, biomarkers, these are called, because they produce a markers of that disease. Again, mass spectrometry, again, was used to quantify this uh, differences in protein between the normal um, prostate fibroblast versus cancer-activated fibroblast. Now, the scientists were able to differentiate that in the cancer patients, there was a difference in the some of the phosphoproteomics, which is called as phosphorylation. So you can differentiate the changes in the phosphorylation. That means some proteins have got more phosphorylated. As a result, they activate downstream signaling pathways, and this have an impact on how tumors can become mutate and how they can uh, modify, which is uh, cancer-associated fibroblast, how they can migrate and also there is a matrix organization that is in the extracellular matrix, how they produce angiogenesis. So this information forms a key for the drug discovery that, okay, this protein is getting enriched. Now you will try to synthesize a uh, molecule. Let's say if you would have heard Jeftinib or any other TIC2 moieties. So they inhibit one enzyme tyrosine kinase 2 and then inhibit that particular protein which is getting enriched in the cancer patients. So again, mass spectrometry again plays a crucial role in identifying this is path pathophysiology. As you see, probably you would have studied in, in pharmacology uh, 
classes or in pharmacology books that this protein gets inhibited in during this disease or if you inhibit this enzyme, you can use it for this sort of treatment. So if you take any cholesterol level lowering enzyme, it is HMG, COA inhibitor, atorvastatin or some other drugs used. So you can gain this key information in pathophysiology that which enzyme is, which protein is getting overexpressed through mass spectrometry, quantify them, and then get back to design some of these in inhibitor. So we have then come to the final stages of my talk, which is on, again, I'm, I'm going to take you through some of the coronavirus, which is now the uh, discussion point, uh, talking point in the entire world. Now in coronavirus, again, uh, you can identify, some of you would have heard that there's a spike protein in the coronavirus, which, which inhibits the, which attacks the ACE receptor and gains entry into the cells. Again, you can see that mass spectrometry is again a uh, uh, choice of tool in some of these cases now because mass spectrometry is extremely fast compared to conventional uh, PC PCR used in this diagnosis. So now what you do is in uh, SARS-CoV, this is a recent article published in one of the journal where you take a patient, you gargle it and take the saliva swab or from the nose and then you dissolve in some solvent and prepare the sample. Again, you can inject the sample into mass spectrometry. Again, you can observe the masses corresponding to this spike protein. So this is how you can use even diagnosis of diseases through mass spectrometry. And mass spectrometry, again, plays a crucial information. So you can see that the sample, the saliva is dissolved in acetone and you do a triptych digestion, which I show, this is a bottom-up approach where you take a protein, digest with the uh, enzyme, and you see a lot of mass spectrometric peaks, peptide peaks. Based on MSMS, you can again interpret the data and to understand whether the patient has a coronavirus or not. So you can see, so this is a bit complex, but if you, if you know the how to do a peptide MSMS, which gives a Y and B ions based on that, you can tell, the patient whether he has the coronavirus or not. So this is again one of the applications uh, used in uh, which you can do an LCMS where the protein is first obtained through gargling and then digested by LCMS uh, and then run those peptide through LCMS, the triptych digest, separate those peptides and identify the spike protein in LCMS by mass spectrometry experiments. Now, the other slide is on, as I told, how spike, how coronavirus infects the angiotensin. So you would have uh, heard that it infects the ACE2 receptor initially in the lungs and then gains its entry into the cells. So again, they have analyzed how mass spectrometry, which part of the protein gets attached. So as you see, the coronavirus is a, uh, sort of 1200, I believe, uh, glycoprotein. So this, gly this protein has undergoes glycation, that is carbohydrate uh, attachments, which is called as N-glycan subtypes. So these are called as subtypes. Now these subtypes then uh, sh uh, show that they can attach to the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor. And this receptor then gets methylated in both the proteins and the proline in the ACE inhibitor. And this proline then aids in the uh, conversion to hydroxyproline, which then enables them to uh, gain entry into human lung cells. Again, mass spectrometry tell, will tell you because the differences in the liver, uh, the you know, differences in the lung amino acid composition of the ACE2 receptor versus the spike protein differences which enable us to identify the mechanism. So once you identify the mechanism of this, this will enable us to understand how body mediates the immune response and how you can develop the vaccine re remedy. And this is one of the application of, again, mass spectrometry. So with this, I would like to conclude uh, my talk. So we have started the talk with what is mass spectrometry? What are the basic experiments we can do in mass spectrometry? So most of you would have thought mass spectrometry means identification of mass. 
actually it is not. It is a lot more to mass spectrometry to do. So we have seen what are the various experiments you can run in mass spectrometry, starting from uh, the MRM analysis, accurate mass analysis, how to do fragmentation. And we have slowly gone through systematically from one case study of impurity ID, metabolite identification, and then translated to complex biologics and then pathophysiology of diseases. If you have seen the slides carefully, the basic experiments remain same, but the interpretation changes. So if you can know what is the basic experiments we need to do and learn on the interpretation skills, you can also do many of these uh, uh, or many of these case studies uh, in an industry or even in the scientific community to understand pathophysiology of various diseases, uh, including cancer, uh, understanding metabolic disorders, uh, including the recent coronavirus. It may be pertinent to add here that the Mass spectrometry is now ubiquitously utilized in all the uh, in the all the phases of scientific drug discovery and development, and also it has been uh, awarded with the like uh, mass spectrometry tool, uh, or the discovery has uh, innovation has received four Nobel prizes uh, till date. It is also important for some of you that mass spectrometry is not only used in pharmaceuticals but also used in various other applications like in semiconductor industries, petroleum industries, aeronautical industries, space, NASA sends some mass spectrometers to Mars or moon to identify what are the elements present in there because mass spectrometry can give you elemental composition. So as you see, mass spectrometry is not only for pharmaceuticals, but if you want to, you can use it in various other, if you, if you go through a search in internet, you can see mass spectrometry in many other industries, semiconductors, polymers, petroleum. So with that, uh, I take this opportunity to first thank the organizing committee for providing me an opportunity to speak uh, in this forum, uh, share my thoughts and knowledge on uh, what is mass spectrometry, uh, how you can use in pharmaceutical industry, how you can perform various experiments from obtaining small molecular mass to a large molecule and its pathophysiology. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Dr. Kumar as well as uh, Dr. Nataraj and Dr. Srinivas for giving me this opportunity to speak in this forum. I also thank my professor, Dr. Uh, Saranjit Singh uh, Naipur Mahali for his guidance uh, during my PhD and Dr. R. Srinivas from Indian Institute of uh, Chemical Technology, who, is, who heads the mass spec department there for his guidance during my uh, master thesis. Also various uh, uh, friends and colleagues from Niper and Industries uh, to enable me to obtain this knowledge and uh, give a talk here. With that, uh, I'll be hope, I will be open to any questions, comments, queries you have, uh, please feel free to ask me. Thank you all for your patience uh, listening. Uh, over to Dr. Natraj. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Any questions from the Zoom box? Please raise the hand. Okay, Venu. Yes, sir. Uh, please uh, unmute and ask the question. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, hi, Venu. Good afternoon, sir. I am studying second M form in Sivishno College of Pharmacy, sir. Okay. How to distinguish between ion source saturation and data to saturation with LCMS and MS? So, uh, if I have understood your questions, you want to look at the uh, saturation in the ion source versus the detector. So the word saturation indicates that you are sending a lot of ions to your detector. So you may have to optimize your uh, sample concentration by uh, sort of uh, decreasing your concentration, preparing much diluted sample 
uh, for your experiments and then see if you can get a linear response in your uh, detector. So by modifying your sample uh, extraction parameters, if you are doing for any uh, biologic or a biometric sample, you can uh, sort of decrease your concentration by dilutions and then see inject it and see if you can uh, get a linear effect in response in your mass spectrometry. Thank you, Venu. Harshita. Sir, good afternoon, sir. Myself, Harshita, from Department of Pharmaceutical Analysis, second year, sir, from Vishnu College. Good afternoon, Harshita. Sir, my question is, uh, sir, we have different mass analyzers, no, sir. How can we select a particular analyzer? That, does it depend on uh, sample or sensitivity or which parameter, sir? So, uh, as you have seen in the slides, uh, it depends on various factors, uh, starting from your sample, what sort of application you need to use. Let's say if you want to do an impurity ID or MET ID, uh, you need to use an accurate uh, mass uh, instrument if you want to characterize it. And if you want, if you are doing some quantification for genotoxic impurities, you need to use uh, techniques like uh, quadrupole and MRM experiments because you are basically quantifying the analyte. Now, if you want to use, uh, let's say, a combination of multi-stage as well as the accurate mass, especially for identification of peptides or even impurities, so you need to use a combination of both of them. So it depends on your sample. What is your application? So what do you want to do in your studies? Are you looking at qualitatively? Are you looking at quantitatively? And then you have to choose a technique depending on the uh, application and the instrument you can use it. Thank you, sir. When do you have any question? One more question, sir. Ah, please, uh, sorry. Sir, hello, sir. Ah. Yeah, Venu. Please go ahead. Why in LCMS with a system, sometimes it observes a different M plus one value, sir? So you see a different M plus one? Yes, sir. So in general, you should not see a different M plus one for that compound because you should always see M plus H only. If you are seeing an M plus one different, that means either sometimes there could be sort of loss of hydrogen, two hydrogens during in-source fragmentation, it is called. That might be one of the reason. The other could be there is some modifications. I have shown in one example where simple deamidation, that is amine, which is converted to carboxylic acid increases mass by one unit. So there might be some things happening in those cases. Or in some extreme cases, you may not generate a molecular ion that is M plus H. Instead, you might generate a fragment ion that is radical fragment ion. In those instances, you may not see an M plus H, but you may see M plus. So that might be one of the reasons why you might see why you may observe a difference in those M plus one intensities. Okay, sir. Anybody from the Zoom box? Questions from the Zoom box? Sir, uh, good afternoon. This is Ganesh, assistant professor from Vishnu College of Pharmacy. Uh, hi, Ganesh, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, Hello sir. Sir, uh, it's a very good, nice session, sir. Sir, I just have a small question regarding the interferences. Sir, say, for example, in an ICPMS, I have a soft hands on working ICPMS. Okay. Uh, while performing some different compounds like uh, sodium silicates, Okay. or uh, sodium cyclo zirconium cyclosilicates. What happens is when we are measuring about 70 to 80 elements in a single sample solution, we are facing some interferences between the isotopes. Okay. So is there any kind of such interferences in this LCMS procedures or some LCMS techniques? Uh, so in ICPMS is mostly used for elemental identifications, mostly yes. metals. So it is an inductive coupled plasma. So in ICPMS, also you see interference. Similar to that, in mass spectrometry, you can see interference. That is why you have to uh, carefully choose your experiments, either MRM or, uh, or SIM mode. That is why those modes are used. You can run a scan from 60 to 600 or 1,000 
but you may show lot of interferences because in matrix there might be a simple a compound with a similar mass might be there so when you run those experiments you can sort of remove those interferences and improve your signal noise so what that is one of the interferences now the other interferences might be your mass spectrometry source might be contaminated or you might see lot of ions so then you might have to clean the source with a pure uh, organic solvents or pure uh, solvents so that you can obtain a better response uh, recently in our paper we have highlighted what are the common contaminants in the mass spectrometry source and how can you uh, sort of remove them probably if you can if you have some time uh, you can please go through that uh, uh, paper and we have given clearly from where the source like you can see some pegylated units coming from in the plastics we use in the ependroff tubes and these might uh, uh, may not give, give you help you to give a response because uh, pegylated might contaminate your source so there are a lot of uh, techniques you need to use uh, especially to remove the contamination uh, even in icpms we can do the same okay thank you sir thank you ganesh so uh, when you analyze this uh, proteomic sample as you indicated they are extremely sort of very low level and you have to be very sensitive your tools have to be extremely sensitive in nature so generally we use uh, instruments like rb trap and then we have to carefully design our experiments like uh, what sort of molecular ion we need to select what sort of mrms we can use in these instances uh, mm -hmm. to in enhance the sensitivity also your sample preparation has a lot of impact if you see the proteomic sample preparation you have to carefully remove all the cells uh, all the biological matrices uh, carefully you need to do various extractions like solid phase extractions uh, liquid extraction liquid liquid extractions or any other uh, ionic liquid extractions to carefully extract these proteins and then enrich these proteins by using uh, any cartridges, SPE cartridges or any other uh, extraction. And then you inject through LCMS or digest them by peptides. And then you have to use various experiments, scanning experiments. So as you have seen, you, you need to run multiple experiments uh, in this LCMS analysis uh, to enrich the uh, sensitivity and also to uh, identify the desired, like what is your study? Is it to understand the signaling pathway? Is it to understand enrichment of some proteins in some disease status or its biomarkers? So depending on that, you might have to uh, sort of design your experiments, do a sample preparation. So each of these steps needs to be selectively optimized. So these are there will be multiple iterations uh, during the cycle where you have to sort of optimize the solvent you select, uh, the extraction method you use. So all these small steps will have a huge impact when we run the LCMS uh, mass spectrometry. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Natra, sir. Sir, Jun, sir. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Questions are available in the Zoom, Zoom box, sir, chat box. They are okay. able to ask by uh, due to some network problem or something. I will, on behalf of them, I would like to ask three more questions, sir. Okay, go ahead. First one is, what is the reason of fluctuations in LCMS? So, uh, if you are asking about the fluctuations of the response in the detector, so sometimes I have seen, uh, especially if... Uh, as if there are uh, some junior members running the instrument, sometimes the flow may not be optimized. If you send it too much of flow, the ionization source cannot handle and evaporate all the solvents. So as a result, you see a lot of differences 
uh, yeah, like lot of signal variation. So always you have to optimize the flow. It is not that if you send high flow rate, you see a high response. Sometimes you have to use a uh, low flow rate, especially for ESI ions, because you use, it can only take up some part like 0.5 ml to evaporate the evaporate the solvent. Now, the other reason could be that uh, in, the, in your sample, the, the sample may not be uh, consistent. There might be a difference in the concentration. So you may inject one concentration at one time and another concentration, so instrument might not pick that. The other could be how clean your instrument is. If the, your instrument is extremely clean and if you keep it without any contamination, you can see a good response. But if your instrument is contaminated by something, you will never see a proper response. So, and the fourth is optimization of your instrument parameters, like what is the collision energy you use? What is the molecular ion you use? Or what is the, for quantification, what fragment ion you use? So all these parameters have a significant impact on to the uh, response you generate. And also uh, your nitrogen gas pressure, sometimes that may not be a constant. So you have to ensure all those, uh, the helium gas purity, all of them may have a slight impact uh, and overall the uh, seesaw effect onto the, your uh, instrument response. Thank you, sir. The next question is, uh, some, 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 some did the work on uh, LCMS, sir, maybe. Uh, the question, the question is the blank, plasma blank shows high intensity for my NX peak, even though the column was completely washed up. What is the reason for this? So that means you are uh, when you inject a plasma, you see a significant peak even in blank also. That means, as we have seen in the slide, that your blank may have a similar mass. So it is important that you might be doing a selected ion mode. You may have to use either MRM mode, that means you have to select one more fragment and then give an instrument from molecular ion to fragment ion. So if you see a huge response in your plasma blank, you are saying that column is washed and there cannot be any interference in your blank, then there must be some other compound or some other mass other than your analyte of interest eluting in that region. That means you have to select a different uh, molecular ion to fragment ion in MRM mode to improve your uh, sensitivity. So you have to ensure that your blank doesn't have any sort of uh, ions in that region. So you may have to optimize different experiments to see that your blank, there is no uh, uh, interference in the blank from your, uh, in that region. Also, you have to ensure that there is no compound in the blank itself. Sometimes in some experiments that compound might be there in the plasma also. So I'm not sure what is the, what you're quantifying, but that should also be taken into consideration. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question, sir. Uh, why does increasing the internal standard concentration improves linearity in LCMS? So internal standard is mostly used for the pharmacokinetic analysis where uh, you generally, because you are during sample preparation, the internal standard will also be lost same as your analyte. So when you select an internal standard, you should ensure that it is similar to that of analyte of interest. Mostly, generally you might select a similar drug or similar polarity, but the best way is to do uh, by using a deuterium uh, moieties. But with respect to the question, why it, it shows uh, better linearity? Maybe if you add more internal standard, it might, because you might have been calculating the ratio of loss of internal standard with respect to drugs. So the ratio of drug versus the internal standard you might be using in your linearity curve. So maybe your internal standard, when you add at a lower level, it might be during the sample preparation or during the uh, matrix uh, sample matrix preparation, it, it might be lost. So maybe that might be one of the reason why when you add more internal standard, 
it might be normalizing the your linearity. Also remember, this is a mathematical calculation. Linearity is response of X uh, with respect to concentration versus response. And then you uh, fit a linear regression equation and then calculate a correlation coefficient. So maybe mathematically, when you increase the concentration, the slight differences uh, in your uh, responses might be uh, amplified. And as a result, you can show it in the linearity graph. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, now the Zoom box question, sir, over, sir. Okay. Generally, we are allowing the Zoom box is only 80 members, sir, above. Then okay. others, others will join in the YouTube channel, YouTube, sir. Okay, okay. So nearly 300 to more than that one may be joined, sir. Okay. For, the, for that one, we are unable to collect the questions from each and every one. Then we are giving one link in the YouTube, sir. Okay, okay. In that, in that link, some questions are uh, available, sir. I would like to ask the questions from the YouTube chat box. Okay. Uh, one of the questions is, why do extremely narrow on the double peaks are produced in LCMS1? Uh, can you repeat the question? Why extremely narrow on double peaks? That means splitting of the peaks, sir. Oh, splitting of peaks. So that is mostly related to your LCMS, uh, LC analysis. So in mass spectrometry, if you are seeing a splitting of peak and there is no splitting of peak in PDA or in UV detector. That means you might be over saturating your detector. So you might have to decrease the concentration. So another reason why you see splitting in your LC is that when you prepare a sample, if you prepare in a high organic diluent, it will always split the early eluting peaks because the Analyte will partition between your stationary phase and mobile phase. As a result of which, if you inject in a high organic solvent, the analyte will, some analyte will partition into stationary phase, some analyte into organic solvent. As a result, you see a split peak. But if you don't see a split peak in chromatography and it's only in mass spec, that means you might be oversaturating your detector. So you should decrease your concentration. Another thing you can do is you have a smoothing in your the software where you can smooth the uh, split peaks. Sometimes it might be useful, especially if you see in a lower concentration, but that won't be splitting like two peaks. It will be a slight, uh, what you can say, slight baseline noise near the tail or front of the peak. So if you observe a split peak in LC, you need to optimize the diluent you use for the uh, mass spectrometry. And always remember that the mass spectrometry is extremely sensitive instrument and you should always inject the lower the concentration, the better it is uh, for obtaining the responses. Thank you very much, sir. The next question is, how to, dis uh, uh, sorry, sir. Uh, how to distinguish between ion source saturation and detector saturation with the LCMS system? I think uh, somebody has asked also previously this question, I believe. So as I indicated, uh, it is mostly related to uh, saturating your ion source with the molecule. So if you can decrease the concentration, mostly this problem should eliminate because whatever the saturation occurs at ion, will ion saturation or at the interface will also go through the detector. So on the last but one question, sir, is, is there any technique useful to make the unionized molecule to ionize in the LCMS? Oh, that's an interesting question. So as I told in the first slide, you have two cases, ESI and APCI. In APCI, you can generally ionize, mostly unionized molecules, like because it's the ionization mechanism is different. Now, there are new ionization techniques, which I haven't discussed in the talk, but there's like atmospheric pressure photoionization, where you use a photons, a laser power to ionize the molecule. Now, there is one more uh, ionization called as a, a DART, uh, which is desorption ambient uh, techniques, where you can ionize the molecules in solid phases only where, by using of various lasers uh, by use of various matrices in MALDI. And sometimes you can derivatize the molecules also. Some molecules will be unionized. 
when you add some derivatization agents like uh, some containing hetero atoms like in some cases uh, in some gta we used uh, like a glutathione you can use it which contain lot of hetero atom just like the derivatization you do in lc and gc you can derivatize in mass spec to improve its response so there are various approaches depending on the experiment you would like to use or depending on the application you have to use you have to uh, carefully choose the uh, either ionization source change or it's the derivatization agents or even sometimes the solvent you use has a significant impact in the lcms like are you using a positive like if you are using a positive mobile phase you should have some acid like formic acid to ionize the molecule if you are using a negative mode we should not use a tfa so there's a lot of consideration we need to take uh, if you want to enhance the ionization or improve the ionization of an unionized molecule so the this uh, this type of the questions uh, just uh, plus or minus uh, equal to our answer they asked several members sir like uh, manisha boddu now uh, naresh marilla jansi rani and several members are asked in the same type of the question sir but okay. anyhow they may they may satisfy with your answers i think thank you very much sir thank you very much now the session is going to be uh, a, a, a very brief nod on to that today's talk given by our great scientist the malikarjun narayanam sir sir first of all uh, we are very much thankful for expressing your research is our first of all generally nobody willing to show their research in the, the seminars and the other, other, other public sector so very grateful to for your work as well as your uh, your inspired uh, talk sir for for today then grateful to grateful for us sir uh, then he expressed the first of all the first few minutes he explained the LCMS and its applications in the industry very extensively, and different scan modes how they plays the important role in the characterization of either the organic compounds or natural compounds or any other metabolites or any other uh, impurities or other things. Sir, actually, uh, different scan modes not uh, not available in the textbooks. First yeah. time I am also studying in the research articles only available. but that is the present uh, just now we understand clearly what is their importance only no where available in the test books sir this with this mode of scan this type of example will uh, satisfy the work of another development or any other characterization like that sir excellence of that uh, explanation sir then uh, importance of lcms while characterizing the impurities on the degradation studies either identification or their characterization using the various study various strategies how many strategies are possible all is you may be uh, explained in that uh, in our talk sir and another important one multi stage mass spectrometry you explained very well sir that is the very critical research in the lcms analysis especially that is only skilled persons only able to understand that concept sir maybe uh, Uh, academicians are also difficult to understand that one. Only who worked on the, uh, the laboratory and industries, especially NIPR, NIPR, IACT, CDRI, and this type of the institutes and this type of the industries, those peoples will be uh, maybe knows about on the multi-stage mass spectrometry and how it will be useful for the, the degradation studies and their characterization. And also he explained the case studies about on the silica print. and especially another most important one genotoxic impurities how to characterize and how to identify it from the lcms studies using the mrm mode we explain the case study imatinib very 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 important molecule easy to understand so first of all we are easy to understand that what is the mrm studies that is useful for the studies and also you uh, explain the Uh, various uh, applications of further applications of bioanalysis how the pharmacokinetic analysis will be carried out by the lcms and various pharmaceuticals identified from the environment the, we have one chapter also sir in the mpharm analysis 
environmental yeah. management uh, how to treat the effluents in the analysis of syllabus sir there we are, there i explained briefly only i'll not that much depth how the lcms is useful because of that is very one small topic only if you are going to study as per your sir, literature it may go to the very long sir very lengthy topic it is and also uh, you are exp uh, expressing the importance of lcms in the biologic studies like omics studies proteomics and as well as the metabolomics for studying the peptides proteins and various large molecules and the lastly you explained about on the importance of covid 19 uh, identification also sir the proteins that is especially spike s proteins how the lcms is useful to identify from the various samples like gargling solution or any blood samples and all these things presently it must be needs otherwise there is no uh, even the tests are also somebody getting the negative today if you are testing yesterday they got the positive again on yesterday if you are testing that is again negative very lot of disturbances are there in the present test available to identify the covid 19 uh, patients sir then so thank you for your excellence uh, presentation of the today's seminar for highlighting the our one week uh, fdp or stp program sir thank you very much sir. thank you sir. thanks a lot uh, for your kind invitation thank you for your acceptance for, for giving in acceptance for our invitation and even we were in the very uh, very uh, uh, free of uh, your precious time uh, uh, spent to our, ourselves sir. thank you very much sir. thank you then let us uh, um, move over to the our director sir for giving a closing note for today's uh, session sir no uh, i think you have given all right so anyway thank you dr narayan for a wonderful talk i think uh, you made it very lucid manner and uh, you have given the complete width and the depth i think uh, this is one of the best uh, webinar which is uh, easily understood by the, all the participants and we made it so neat and clean so thanks a lot and uh, uh, thank you all for uh, all the participants for uh, participating in this webinar and uh, i see a good uh, interaction and uh, uh, i'm sure you all get a convincing answers from the expert today uh, so thank you all and hope to see you all uh, again tomorrow so thanks dr for, uh, for taking out time it's a very nice presentation Thank uh, we, are, we are proud of you as an i pride once again thank you thank you doctor yeah. thank yeah. you thank you so much for your kind words today our guru ji sir also giving very excellency of the <laughs> topic sir today the student of our also sarojit singh sir and malikarjun sir also giving the excellency presentation sir that we are highlighting our seminar sir our webinar sir thank you very much sir thank you thank you thank thanks you. a lot uh, have a good stay take care yeah bye thank, thank you. you take care bye Hi sir thank you sir